Uh, our next speaker uh, is Josh Hartlock. Uh, I know Josh for several years now. I was impressed by what he and his team were able to accomplish. Uh, Josh is uh, he's the co-founder of Electro.Arrow. Uh, he co-founded the uh, he's a co-founding partner of Electro Venture and innovation director of Electro.Arrow. And Fly on E, that's how I pronounce it. Okay. Uh, Josh has two decades of uh, experience developing and commercializing electric propulsion and autonomous systems. He is an entrepreneur and robotic engineer. Yeah, I need to talk to you more about that. Uh, has uh, specialized in electric propulsion technologies. Josh founded the Electro Dot Arrow to help safely propel the uh, sustainable aviation industry. Uh, through developing and commercializing electric charging system, very important, critically important uh, for aircraft development partners, including electrical management system and other proportion subsystem. Josh also founded the uh, SAE AE7D, which I'm also a member of, which is uh, one of the very important uh, committee for aircraft charging standard in 2018 and was chair uh, since uh, until 2022. A lot of effort Josh has put in and helped the industry moving forward. So let's welcome Josh. Thank you, Johnny, and great to be a part of this community. So uh, we've been at it for a while. That's <laughs> a lot of uh, familiar faces here. And uh, we're on the very other side of the earth in Chandicott, Perth, Western Australia. But we are constantly here. In fact, 80% uh, of our sales are in the US, mostly California. Um, but a lot of the activity is in Europe as well. So a really skilled team that is passionate about making a difference. And I sort of emphasize that we're more the, the shovels to the gold rush, that we're really providing the tools to help other aviators, like brilliant airframers we have on stage, um, to make sure they can charge their aircraft when they need them as fast as possible. And we have a deep understanding of aviation. My uh, co-founder is a pilot, and we've been actively operating aircraft for over six years, electric aircraft, as well as um, really committed to the customer service. So we don't really tout ourselves that much, but our customers know us very well because we are very responsive, including a lot of late night calls uh, from Australia. So we've been charging aircraft uh, since uh, yeah, a long time now, since 2016, uh, with Ampere originally and a bunch of other customers, some we can't talk about and then uh, actually flying aircraft ourselves since 2017. So really being an operator as well, and our partner company, Fly On E, who's been continually operating those aircraft for the last five years, um, it really kind of means that we know what we're doing. We have sort of school of hard knocks of operating aircraft ourselves. Now, our products are really end-to-end -end solutions for charging, because while we started focusing just on the charger, it was very apparent very quickly, as Harbor experienced, that the grid infrastructure is actually the bottleneck. Now, the portability of our chargers has always been important, but where they get the energy from is just as important. So as well as the world-leading portable chargers, we also focus on these energy storage solutions, often abbreviated as BESs, so battery electric uh, uh, solutions that are effectively buffers. So the best way to explain this is, yeah, your limited 220 volt in you know, a single phase or a three phase at best is not going to fast charge any of these aircraft. So you really do need that buffer in the middle to dump the energy in. And then best case scenario, you're also powering it mostly from renewable energy, especially if you're doing uh, daylight uh, VFR, you may as well be charging off the sun. Really, we've done a lot with Vertiport design that I can't share, but I've used as generic images of airframes as possible to, uh, to convey what we're doing. And, and the unique part is that we're not just the charger, we're not just the energy, but we actually do onboard electronics to help our customers integrate battery management system, fault tolerant redundancy, a lot more, again, I can't talk about, but there's some exciting stuff happening there. And again, we're only allowed to mention a few airframers, but these are some uh, that have given us permission to mention our collaboration with them. And it gives a nice diversity showing the range from fixed wing, multi-rotor, tilt uh, propulsion, and tilt airframe. So that's sort of a pretty good spread. I mean, I know there's over a thousand of them out there lately, so this is just a good general uh, snapshot of some great uh, airframers we're working with. And industry partners. So we know we can't do it on our own, and we do need to collaborate. So really, we've focused on these partnerships that add value to what we're already doing and making sure that they're 
uh, integrating our hardware and software solutions into what they're doing for airport vertiport design. Um, and obviously, uh, it, uh, financing is really important for affordability and, uh, and making sure we're integrating with existing airports as well to not be uh, kind of designing in a silo. So why don't you use car chargers? Well, it's probably obvious, but for those who don't already know, they're uh, fixed, stationary, typically. Uh, you can try to put them on wheels, but they're usually very heavy. Uh, so the mobility is a problem. Even the height of them is a problem. You know, most wingspans are around that mid to, you know, chest to head height. Uh, and really bumping into them would be a problem. With cable reach, that's going to be a problem, right? You know, you've got 20 meter wingspan aircraft. Uh, trying to get these three meter cables from a car charger is going to be a problem. And supporting advanced uh, hardware and software capabilities is going to be really critical too. Now modularity uh, is going to be very relevant when I show you the next few slides in the sense that we've already got an abundance of standards out there for charging, but also an abundance of locations of where the inlets are on these airframes. So this is a fixed wing example where you want to be able to park up at an apron that's maybe a bit far away from your energy source. Uh, so the mobility of the charger is very important. So this is our 240 kilowatt charger, which we've won an Australian uh, uh, grant, finally, for funding uh, this program. So we're actually going to be deploying this uh, down in uh, Murray Field. It's about an hour south of Jandicott, so we can fly uh, fixed wing aircraft and eventually VTOLs. Thanks so much. Uh, down there and demonstrate and have that as somewhat of a center of excellence of uh, people being able to bring their aircraft and fly that. Uh, so it's an hour drive, but it's about, you know, 15 minute flight. So you can fly between Jandicott and Murrayfield and fast charge and fly back again. So what's happening in standards? I could talk all day about this, but I only have five to six minutes more. So with uh, megawatt charging, we're very supportive of what's happening in that space, but sub-megawatt is really what's most important right now for the current size of aircraft and the power requirements. So as much as I've had good intentions to standardise to one uh, standard over the last five, six years, there have emerged about six different standards that people are using. So it is sometimes frustrating, but I won't get on my high horse too much about that. So, look, we, we really realise, though, as much as we're, you know, promoting a particular standard that we feel really strongly about, we also have to be agnostic. So all our chargers can charge any of these standards, and we have customised, you know, unique proprietary standards too. Um, but we are gravitating towards 6968 for that sub-half megawatt. And for the megawatt plus, we do believe that AIR 7357 that we're working on in the Standards Committee is looking quite promising, and, um, and that's really leveraging the great work of the automotive industry, uh, particularly around commercial trucking. Uh, we've developed patent pen technology to enable charging all of them. So the thing that we, you know, I guess we pivoted over the last couple of years was, use our standard, use our standard, use our standard. You know what, we're just going to make it, we'll charge any standard, <laughs> because we don't want to have the industry polarized between standards and then the hardware is all different. So we really want to make sure the connector is something we can modularly change, but the infrastructure, the grid installation and the uh, mobility of the physical AC to DC converting is as uh, universally usable as possible. So why not CCS? I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to get on my high horse a little bit here, but uh, <laughs> um, we use CCS2 in Australia just to avoid any uh, misconceptions. I've got nothing against it for automotive but it really doesn't work in all these other complex ways you plug into aircraft, like up into wings and whatnot. Um, and large and heavy inlets uh, is a problem in a lot of these light aircraft because you have a whole complex assembly of the way you lock the connector in, um, which is fine on a car, but on an aircraft weight matters and, and space is really critical. Redundancy is, um, is really important uh, for uh, onboard aircraft, but you don't need a redundant AC charging system if you can't justify the weight of the AC to DC converter onboard the aircraft. Uh, and they don't have 28 volt auxiliary power like we do in AS6968, which is again very valuable to reduce the weight of the onboard DC to DC converter. So instead of having to have this oversized converter to power all the low voltage stuff, you can have just sized correctly for flight and then in ground you can retop up that 28 volts as well. So all these weight saving benefits that people don't often think about. The PLC, Power Level Communication Protocol, is too noisy, so there's a lot of uh, evidence and testing in the megawatt class that they're moving away from it, and any long cable lengths it really wasn't designed for. Small pins, so these are 8.5mm DC pins versus the 12mm pins we have in 6968 and the 20mm pins that are in the uh, megawatt charging standard. So, you know, fundamental physics does still apply that the copper area is going to be how, dictating how much current you can dissipate without um, active liquid cooling or even with liquid cooling. 
The locking mechanism is on, on board the aircraft for CCS2. So again, that's a failure mode that means it needs like a full certification type assessment to replace versus a, a lock on a plug that is, is serviceable off board the aircraft. And yeah, the fact that even when people are like, we're using CCS, well, which one? <laughs> one or two? <laughs> because they're actually very different. And one is North America, two is Europe and Australia and uh, neighboring countries that um, they are physically different enough that it's actually just as much, if not more, a pain than uh, having one international standard. So again, I won't get in the weeds on this. I'm conscious of time. I want to make sure there's room for Q&A. But we did base SAE's 6968 standard off the physical GBT coupler, but I want to make it very clear that it's quite different uh, by now. Um, so there are a few things, higher voltages, both in uh, HV and low voltage. Uh, automatic starting was really important for the time and the fact that you're kind of far away from the charger by the time you plug in. You don't have to walk back and forth and start things. Uh, lock activation timing, uh, being able to remotely start. Maximum cell count was important. I could go on. So feel free to hit me up after for anything technical. <laughs> Look, with the fact that we've started as a charger company, well, we started as an aircraft you know, operating and building company, evolved into a charger company, and now we're really an onboard electronics company. Because when we do sell our chargers to customers, the second conversation is always, oh, how do we communicate to this thing? It's like, well, we've, we've got you back. Um, so these onboard control electronics, both the we have a seven inch daylight visible display, which has been used on the dash of smaller aircraft, or even next to the inlet of larger aircraft, quite valuable to have that feedback, especially during testing. And the, um, the onboard uh, charge control units, which are now, uh, which we've been designing for AS9100, DO178C, 254, and so forth. And that's not easy, as you know. <laughs> I think most of you in the aviation community know those certifications are challenging, but worth doing, because then you do have that uh, moat around being certified for onboard aircraft use. So the 240 is already being developed and have customer orders uh, that we'll be delivering around mid next year realistically as far as certified uh, functional operation, but that doesn't preclude us working closely with you in a prototype capacity. If you'd like to talk to us about that, uh, come see me. And the fact that the uh, Vertic charger we've developed has really been driven by the requirements of our customers and, uh, and there's a lot of conflicting requirements that we've had to factor in. So you've seen all the different uh, you know, ilks of VTOL layout and you can imagine almost none of them have the inlets in the same location. So the location of the inlets and getting to them is a big part of our design philosophy. So flexibility, uh, having this uh, uh, scissor arm come out to meet the aircraft and not drag a cable on the ground is really important for reliability and maintenance. And then the two plugs on the end of the actual charge unit allows us to reach around to wherever needs to be uh, of the airframe. So the fact that we can do up to half a megawatt per coupler with AS6968 is very exciting, uh, a little less with CCS12. Uh, but the fact that you can theoretically deliver up to a megawatt in two inlets is exciting and it means we don't actually need to go to MCS yet if people have at least two or more inlets. And MCS is really, I see it as multi-megawatt standard. So it's really if you want to deliver two or more megawatts to an aircraft, then you'd say have one or two MCS connectors. The fact we can get the charge module all the way around the back of the aircraft is valuable because that really gives it agnostic accessibility from the front and even if the inlets are on left and right wings which is very common these days you can bring those charging cables up from the back and still have uh, passenger access without getting in the way of cables and having any trip hazards. So the modularity I'll, I'll reiterate one last time the fact that if customers do want to order it with CCS1 and CCS2 I won't fight them, but I will convince them to evolve eventually to uh, the standard. And for now, at airports, we just have to be conscious of the fact that there may be mixed standards for now, um, but hopefully we can still uh, you know, converge on a, on a standard in the future. Having two four-metre liquid-cooled cables means we still have that eight metres of span. So as far as like if you're designing inlets, keep them within eight metres of each other. <laughs> but apart from that, um, that's more than flexible for most applications. And single person movable was really important. The fact that being able to just push it out um, was very critical uh, to not require extra complexity. And uh, yeah, a lot of protected IP and what we're doing. Now, just to give you an insight into the future with MCS, this is really more becoming uh, airport fixed infrastructure. There is some, you know, hardware you're going to have to lay. The rest of it, we've managed to do it mostly just dropping containers on site and connecting it to whatever limited grid you've got. But for megawatt charging, it's a serious infrastructure installation. You do need to really lay a lot of, uh, a lot of copper to uh, get that power. But again, that movability of the air, 
charger, even at the megawatt class, which we're not disclosing yet what we're doing, but we've got some great technology around getting that megawatt of power to the aircraft when it's uh, parked up at the, uh, the terminal. So just to reiterate, we're the building blocks for sustainable aviation charging. Uh, we're really about portability, mobility, quick deployability, because as you can imagine, approvals for fixed infrastructure on airports is an absolute nightmare. It's extremely time consuming to go through that process. So we've avoided that through these modular solutions. Um, advanced fire suppression in all our batteries, uh, connecting for uh, future charges for not just aircraft, the fact that we can charge cars and other things off the back of these containers. Integrated DC fast charging for the ground control equipment and cloud connectivity is very critical. So yeah, plan your power bay. So it's kind of the, uh, the, the buzzword we're saying is like how much power do you need and you want a future proof for that. So really when we're designing these vertiports, <clears throat> some of them are very ambitious with how many megawatts they want to charge and they might only have like 100 kilowatts of grid connection at the moment. Like, well, you better leave some space then for our batteries. And that's really important to make sure that they're designing it in a progressive way. We don't want them to have to spend millions of dollars on batteries from day one to charge one or two aircraft. So scaling it and making sure there's physical land area to add more batteries later is a critical part of the design philosophy. And in summary, look, we really appreciate uh, that there's so many amazing airframers here and uh, projects. We'd love to work with them all. We already, uh, we consider ourselves a majority leader in this position already, but we want to maintain that leadership position and uh, make sure that we've at least had a conversation with every airframer. A lot of them we can't talk about, sadly, so it's, it's uh, a lot of NDAs, as you can imagine. But we do want to make more public awareness of the fact that we're agnostic to your airframe and we're here to support you. So really um, reach out to me and uh, my team. We're happy to work with you. And our product offerings really cover that full spectrum. So as you go uh, more power hungry aircraft, we'll keep up. But uh, for now, we already have some amazing offerings that we'd love to support and get out in the industry. So thanks for your time. Joshua, for you, um, is Electro Aero looking at locations that are restricted on space? So you, you showed the batteries. Are you looking at portable batteries, battery trucks by chance, and looking at bringing in <coughs> electricity that's um, from a, a food chain, if you will? Yeah, it's an interesting view. Uh, we've tended to not put them on trucks because they still have to be plugged in some way. We are containerized, so they can technically carry the container on a truck, so like temporarily. But generally, by the time you've fixed install it to some grid, even if it's limited, then you don't need to move it. So we tend to more, you know, tilt tray, drop it, connect it. Um, but yeah, look, the idea of portable storage for, say, a unique application, like a one-off, you know, fly-in or something, certainly. Um, we do, you know, we'd love to have uh, our containerized batteries on the back of a, you know, semi, Tesla semi, ideally, or some electric semi-truck, so then it's truly sustainable in the way it's getting there and delivering the power. But we do prefer to use whatever limited grid power there is, like, even if it is only seven kilowatts. Like, if you have seven kilowatts continually charging that battery all day and night, it's not a useless amount of energy. It's enough to fast charge, like, a half hour or so. So you still, still want to connect to the grid wherever you go. Well, I definitely see a cottage industry for you and in going out and rescuing people who have run out of power oh, yeah. <laughs> along the route. <laughs> yeah, I could charge a lot for that. Uh, this is a good idea, I think. So. I practically had the same question as Rex, but on that note, I wonder if there's other iterations uh, that we have not seen in terms of form factors for, for energy or batteries or, or recharging services. Yeah, I constantly have to bite my tongue on all the exciting things we're working on for different airframers, but, um, but certainly portability, like I mentioned. And I'd say it's not so much about portable energy, it's more about portability of delivering the energy. So that cable management has been core part of our IP, so getting it from wherever the limited grid power is, you know. And I, I sort of joked as I walked into the hall, I'm like, oh, yep, they, they still manage cables like that. You know, you lay cables across the floor and you cover them in tape. Uh, that's the sort of, you know the way uh, you do it for low power. For high power, you know, you got a bit more serious considerations around cable management. So we've been very um, conscious that a thousand volt, you know, a thousand amp cables, it's a pretty serious bit of infrastructure, but we have done some exciting stuff about laying them fairly thin, uh, low profile, um, which I'm not going to disclose much more now, but um, you can imagine sometimes there's a, you know, power station at one end of the airport, but you actually want to operate the other end of the airport. So getting the power from there to there in a way that's acceptable to the regulators is a big part of it. So.